Like Matt said, the Trinity is one of those mysteries that is so beyond our logic. There's no way one equals three and three equals one. We learn that before we even get to school. But yet here we are celebrating this mystery that is beyond logic, but not beyond truth. And so we come for God to meet us where we are, to take us a little bit beyond who we are and where we are. When Mac, who's the protagonist of this story, meets the Trinity uh, for the first time, they're doing this round of introductions, and then he asks the question, right, that we all ask, okay, yeah, but who's really God? And my favorite nerdy moment is how all three of them say at the very same time, I am, which is the most awesome play on words, right? Because we know that's the name God tells Moses from the burning bush of who God is, I am. So that, that's my favorite geek out moment. <laughs> it's just really satisfying. Um, but we all feel like Mac, right? So which one really is it? I am, I am, I am, I am. And so we come to this book and that, this movie that fascinates me because it's one of the first ones in popular fiction um, that addresses God as Trinity and not as one person. And that's a great gift to us that, that we haven't had. Um, so for those of you who have not read the book or know the movie, it's about a story of a man named Mac who's a really good guy, good Christian, good father, good husband, and the unthinkable happens, the worst happens. His baby daughter is taken by a serial killer. And the shack is the shack where the bloodstain is found, where they know that she has been killed. It is the place that each of us have in our lives of the undoing of our life and our faith as we know it and as who we are. And this story is about the way that experience broke Mac, broke his family, broke his faith, undid everything. And it's about God meeting him at the shack, at that place of brokenness, to help him put the pieces back together to find peace once more. Now, God is the Trinity. Jesus is played by Avram Aviv Alush, an Israeli actor. The Holy Spirit is played by Sumira Matsubara, a Japanese actress. God, Papa, that's what uh, Mac's wife's Nan um, that's what she calls God. Papa is played by Octavia Spencer from Alabama. And male Papa is played by Grant Green from Six Nations Reserve um, in Ontario, Canada. And then lastly, there's Alice um, Braga Morat. And I'm sorry, I'm terrible with actors, so I know that I'm butchering these names, and I apologize. Um, but um, this Brazilian actress plays the part of Sophia, Lady Wisdom, that we just read in the Proverbs passage. Um, so I want to go back to Papa, um, because this movie not only, and this book, not only talks about God as Trinity, but talks about God beyond gender, and talks about God as a truth who is beyond us, who comes to us and meets us where we are and what we need to be able to take us deeper into the mystery. As we're gonna hear from a clip, um, Max got all the questions and all the anger that I want us to find the freedom to address to God directly. Um, and then see how God takes that misunderstanding of the mystery and helps us move deeper in, higher up and further in into God's truth. We can see is our pain, we lose sight of God. And what we want most is a simple, easy fix that God tells us straight up, even God, omnipotent God, can't give us. That life takes a little bit of time and a lot of relationship. God didn't come to Mac as a man because Mac was abused by his father. And as he's dealing and reeling from his daughter being killed, God comes to Mac as a mother to first heal the relationship with his father. And the way the Trinity does that, the way all of them play a role in bringing that about, 
the climax of that is in the chapter 15 called Festival of Friends, and I'm sorry, but the movie genre does not do anywhere near what the book is able to do and paint the picture of imagination and the way that this goes beyond anything we could think of and put together ourselves. And it's beautiful, and it's that power, and it's that healing that God then uses the freedom that that release, that that forgiveness gave Mac and his life, the way that it widened his spectrum and enabled him to see what before he couldn't see, that's then what empowers him to do the impossible, to forgive the man who abducted Missy, his daughter. And the book says it best when when Mac is at that point, God shows up as a father. And God tells Mac, because you're going to need a father for the work that you have to do today. Barry. love Mac because when God asks those level of asks from us, my two-year-old self has to have space to throw the temper tantrum and throw something down and flop down and protest because God's asks are big. But there is a reason Holy Trinity keeps asking. Forgiveness isn't about establishing a relationship and becoming best buds with this person. Forgiveness is about removing our stranglehold on his throat to give room to trust God and for God to work. And most importantly, so that our own capacity to love is not crippled from it. Healing comes because Mac goes into the hard place and confronts it and does the work. And even when he goes back, he does what female papa tolls, tells him to do and repairs the relationship with his oldest daughter and with his other family. And the movie ends with them singing, Awesome God. And we have a whole new level of appreciation for how awesome, awesome God is. I would like today to ask for you to go with me one step further beyond this movie. And I ask this in the spirit of this movie, of meeting Mac where he is and asking him to go to a harder place, to go to a greater truth beyond than where he starts. I ask this as a pastor who's been with you all for two years now and knows your hearts and loves you and watches the goodness and the way that you care for each other every week and who knows how proud I am, and heck, if there's anything that, that witnesses to how much you care about each other in the church, it's this mortgage initiative and hitting 91% in a month. That's amazing, and it's beautiful, and it's good. And there's something I would like for us to work on together. And this movie exemplifies it perfectly. I want us on this Memorial Day weekend as we remember those who went to the graveyards after the Civil War 
to look at the racial divide that exists in our country and what it means to live in a culture with systemic racism embedded in it. And I want us to go to this place knowing that I'm not here to demonize anyone individually. That because we live in this culture doesn't mean that we're bad people. The badness comes in when we choose to use, we as white people choose to use our privilege to reinforce the racial inequality and injustice that is present instead of using our privilege to dismantle it. The fact that we're here doesn't have that value piece added in. So I hope that as we go into this, we can keep the individual and the systemic separate. That you can hear how much I see and appreciate your goodness and how I would like to call myself a good person as well. And know that I have something to work on. Because part of being white in a culture of systemic racism means that we can hold values of equality and, and believe them with all of who they are and have those be our core values and still act in ways that undermine those values, that are opposite and contrary to those values. It's our implicit bias. It's the residue of growing up and being enculturated into systemic racism. It's automatic, it's unconscious. It doesn't mean that we're a bad people. It means that there's an issue in our culture that God is calling us to put into God's hands to help us move beyond and work through. And the reason I bring this up with the shack is because this way that the Trinity is personified is that example of implicit bias, is the example of the intentions of William Young working to bring diversity, to widen our spectrum, to make room for all of who God is, because quite frankly, with all the struggles that we all go through in life, I don't know why we would ever want to limit the access to the power that we have to fight those struggles or make it only come in one way or one piece to us. I want the whole thing because life is hard and devil is real and he knows what he's doing. I want all of God's power. And that was the intention of Young and his book. But there's something that works contrary to that intention with the Trinity because just as he is seeking, and especially this becomes even more true for the movie and the way that the characters of God are personified, just as his young is working to expand our truth of all of who God is, he's actually limiting it. He's choosing one very narrow aspect of the complexity of human beings in an African-American woman and portraying her as the mammy. And he's choosing one aspect of the full complexity of human beings and Native American fathers and portraying him only as the wise grandfather. Those are two images and two portrayals that are acceptable from these persons of color and white privilege and systemic racism. It is not the fullness of who they are. And the sinful irony of it is how softly and gently they lead a white man through the loss of his daughter. We don't need a biblical ethic to know the pain and the danger of hypocrisy, of requiring some people to treat us one way and not requiring that of ourselves to treat them in a similar way. Again, I am speaking from a white standpoint. It wasn't until pastoring a predominantly African and African American congregation that I began to see a truth that never has been and never will be my own or the way that the world has interacted with me. But I did begin to see it. And because I began to see it there, I began to reread some of history and found out how the Cherokee tribe, one of the largest in the United States, was one of the ones who adopted the United Methodist policy of civilization the most um, holistically. 
Not only did they give up over 90% of their land in the southeastern part of our country, but they adopted a constitution and a form of government that parallels the United States. They did everything that was asked of them, of the white person, in order to continue living and sharing this land. But then, when the white common man wanted what the wealthy white man had, Andrew Jackson campaigned in support of the common man and marched Cherokee fathers and mothers and children and the trail of tears where their children died. And it wasn't an individual, a sick individual this time that kidnapped a daughter and took her life. It was a governmental policy in an entire nation who had told a people that they would be fine if they became like us. They became white and civilized. And then when they had done that said, no, actually you're savage and there's nothing you can do about it. Just last month, I was in Memphis for the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. And I sat in a worship service of an Episcopal church where its very parking lot um, was a slave auction site, where the only plaque to that was of Nathan Bedford, a, a Confederate general who was a wealthy businessman from his business enterprises. Not only was he a slave auction owner, but he specialized in selling illegal slaves, illegally imported because there was a ban on importation after 1808. They stood in that service as a college student and others from the community, as the church and the college had partnered together to do further research to rescue what names and ages could be found. And I stood as the names of ages of babies were shared who had been sold. I listened to a colleague who was working through what it meant and sharing with us for when she does genealog genealogy and ancestry work to trace it back to a bill of sale. And then we went to a lynching site where a man was burned alive, his nose cut off, and his head decapitated, where 5,000 people gathered for that event, where parents wrote permission slips to bring their kids out of schools to attend that event. Where was the softness and gentleness there for the parents watching their son burned alive? Before we think that this is ancient history, before you get angry with me for bringing up things of the past that have nothing to do with us today because we weren't slave owners, I want us to understand that we are all born into this culture, that privilege is ours. And from the stories I heard from my congregation, when an SPRC chair is late, an hour late to the meeting because three empty cabs passed him by and refused to pick him up. When one of the African American parishioners, the only time he was called by the church to do anything was when they were putting on the play Driving Miss Daisy. And where he gave a laugh that showed how deep it cut that the worst thing you could ask me to do was be on a stage and how that was the last thing he liked or could do as from who he was. For another engineer who sent the exact same report as his white predecessor in that position simply with numbers updated and then got the report back completely marked in red asking if he had ever been to school. There are more and more and more of these stories there is still residue that our brothers and sisters of color are dealing with. It is not a truth that is ours as white people. The world does not interact with us in this way. But it doesn't mean that what they experience and go through isn't true. 
here's where I also have the hardest time. That when we hear of the reality of racism, there are many of us as white people who then talk about the suffering that we have been through. And as Papa says, there are gonna be scars in this world. There are gonna be signs of what evil and forces of wickedness do, and none of us are immune from that. But we who are white are immune from the suffering that comes because of the color of our skin and the layer of interaction that that brings in this world. And what saddens me the most is when we use our suffering as a get out of jail free card instead of as a way to see the world differently. I want Mac who has now had the experience that others have had to not stay in his white congregation singing awesome God. I want him to go to the gospel choir and see them singing there is a balm in Gilead. I want him to go to the Latin American church grieving the desaparecidos and singing Tu has venido a la orilla. I want him to go to the Korean church praying in Tong Song Gido. I want us to follow the trail of tears and of suffering and understand how it unites us all. Do you all know the Bacon Rebellion that happened in 1676? It was a rebellion of European indentured servants and Africans. And when that rebellion happened, when there was solidarity in suffering, there was literally a letter that was sent to England explaining what had happened and the divide and conquer strategy. It is not until after that rebellion that the word white appears in our early colonial laws. Before then, it was always Christian or Englishmen. Forces of wickedness and powers of evil know what they're doing. And until we are able to overcome rejecting another's truth because it's not our truth, until we are able to find solidarity and suffering, those powers of evil will win. And it's happened here at Epworth. I want us to do what I have not been able to do here. In the last year, there was a parishioner who asked for prayer for us, for two people who had been killed, two persons of color who had been killed in the city in the same week. And when I went up to follow back up with this parishioner about it, of could I come and pray or what would be most helpful, I was told that it wasn't necessary, that it was fine because this is something that community, the community of color, is used to. It's not a tragedy for them as it is for us. Thankfully, there was another person there to counter that and say that it was a tragedy and affirm that. And as hard as that statement and as awful as that statement was, that wasn't the worst thing. The worst thing was that I let it drop. I didn't ask again if I could be present. One obstacle, one statement, and my white training kicked in to choose calm over content, to not do conflict, but to let things lie. The enculturation we have gone through is real and it is with us every single moment of the day. And in that moment, I was the moderate Christian Martin Luther King Jr. wrote about from his letter from a Birmingham jail, where he says, I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in the stride towards freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice. And that was me. So how do we turn to our siblings in AA who know what it is to claim a truth that's hard to claim, to at least name it, the sin that clings so closely, that has such a stranglehold on us? Hi, I'm Kate, and I'm a racist. And what does it mean in that naming to then find power, to find community, 
to find people who will help us to see differently, who will help us to dismantle and disrupt the impossible, who will help us to find a new way of living, because I want it. I want it so badly. There's a sociologist, Michael Emerson, who has statistically proven that when church is the church, the good people that we are, taking care of each other, helping each other find jobs, helping each other find houses, helping each other make it through really horrible weeks, and helping with childcare or bringing in food, helping get over that horrible month, When we do that, when the church is the church across racial, ethnic, cultural lines, when the church is the church multi-ethnically, multi-culturally, the inequality of the city that church is in reduces. Statistically proven. And if that is not our Methodist call to be disciples for the transformation of the world, then I don't know what is. And I want that transformation. I want my capacity to love to be uncrippled. I want the suffering that I have experienced to be transformed into a power that can transform people's lives, mine included. I want God to be all of who God is so that I, made in the divine image of God, can be all of who I am. And that's going to take a lot of work for me as a white person. But it's work that I would like to do, and it's work that I would like to do with you. I would like to disrupt this implicit bias that keeps us doing the very thing we don't want to do, that undermines the values and the witness we share and give. That is my hope, and that is my prayer. And I would ask that you join me this week in spending a little bit more time finding out who the person of God is that we need, that we haven't spent a lot of time with, so that we can have more access to all of who God is. And I would also ask that we spend time with a friend who is different from us in some way. First, asking if they have space and time to talk with us on that level. Second, asking, what do I need to know that I don't know because I don't go through the world in your body? May God unite us in solidarity for the kingdom. Amen. We close with a hymn of one who went through that exact process in the slave trade. Would you stand and join in singing?